Well, good morning. It's so good to be with you again. And uh, as we spend time in the Word of God together, I call it my my BLT, the Bible in Lifetime. So this morning, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, a miraculous birth that took place even before the miraculous birth of our Savior. It's the birth of a birth of a prophet. And uh, as we look into the scripture together, if you'd grab your Bibles, we're in Luke chapter 1. The whole chapter is a long one, 80 verses. But uh, before we look into this miraculous birth, the making of a prophet, let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for everyone who's tuned in this morning uh, to hear a message from the Word of God. Your Word is a light to our feet, a lamp for our path, as Psalm 119 says, and uh, another passage that says, uh, I will uh, meditate on your word, and it will keep me from evil. Lord, thank you so much for the truth of your word that enables us to be wise also and to salvation and gives us the great truth of the message of the gospel. And so, Lord God, we pray you bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you've ever been witness to a live birth, you've been witness to a miracle. When people say miracles don't happen today, they evidently don't have children or grandchildren. And my wife and I have five children, four girls, and my only begotten son, Josh, is right in the middle. And then we now have eight grandchildren. Can you believe it? Eight. Uh, my mom is 89 years old, and she has a lot of great grandkids, right? They're great in... Uh, not only in the name, but also just they're just great kids, and we're very thankful for each one of them. But again, uh, the birth of a baby is truly amazing. And uh, my wife, uh, we had, uh, let's see, our first baby, Christy, was born naturally. Our second baby, Becky, baby Becky, was, uh, was kind of tweaked around in the womb, and so we had to do a C-section. We planned her birthday which, by the way, is uh, was yesterday, December the 12th. And then Josh was to be born naturally, but as the contractions continued, there was a, a problem. His heart rate would go down every time a contraction hit. And so upon inspection, it was discovered that Josh had a prolapsed cord. And that simply meant that the, uh, the umbilical cord had gone before him in the birth canal, and every time there was a contraction, it cut off his oxygen supply. And if it would be allowed to uh, continue, Josh could have either passed away in birth or had some serious uh, birth defects and problems. So we're very thankful for medicine. We're very thankful for the doctor who cared for Terry in that birth. And upon discovering that, that the, the uh, umbilical cord was prolapsed, he said, we're going to do a crash C, crash C. And I wasn't exactly sure what Crash C was, but all of a sudden I had some medical gowns thrown at me and coverings and so forth. He says, put these on as soon as you can. They wheeled Terry out on her haunches, you know, on her knees and elbows to prevent Josh from going into the birth canal anymore. And the next thing I know, I was ushered into the, the birthing room and <clears throat> Terry was given uh, some sleepy time juice and little Josh was born. And it was, it was wonderful. All the births of our children were just glorious. I, 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 it was a time to really worship and praise God for the miracle of birth. And Josh was born healthy, and we're very thankful. And uh, all of our children were born he healthy. We're very thankful for God's provision. And there are other miraculous births in the Bible, right? There's the birth of Isaac to Abraham and Sarah, who were beyond birthing years. I mean, uh, somebody put it like this. Um, yeah, they just didn't have the power or the ability to, uh, to, to give birth because they were, yeah, beyond the time. And God intervened and gave a miraculous birth to Abraham and Sarah, little Isaac. And then there's the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where God gives a promise that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, with 
us God. And that birth was fulfilled in the Gospels. We find it in, in the, the book of Luke, how the angel came and visited Mary and said, you will bear a son. She said, how can this be? And I don't know a man. And uh, the angel said that the Spirit of the Lord will come upon her. But even prior to that, there's a miraculous birth of uh, preparation for the Messiah's coming. And as we enter into this Christmas season, we need to prepare our hearts for this time of celebration where we worship the birth of our King. But this other miraculous birth that took place happened between two older people as well. You have your Bibles. Again, open them to Luke chapter 1. And we're going to look at the parents of this miraculous birth uh, of a coming prophet whose name was John. Uh, looking at Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 5, we find that the parents of this prophet were faithful people. It says in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of the Lord, observing all the Lord's commands and regulations blamelessly but they had no children. Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. They were upright people, godly people. They were faithful to God. Both Zechariah and Elizabeth were believers. They were, again, upright. The word actually is righteous in the original text, when someone is righteous, how, how do you become righteous before God? Many times individuals think that being called upright or righteous has to do with your actions. And certainly there is evidence there that they upheld the word of God, that they lived obediently. But you know, righteousness from God is not given by what we do. It's given to us by faith. Many times in, in our religious upbringing, we think that God is like the stern uh, teacher who gives us a grade based on our performance. But the reality of it is, is that's not true because the Bible tells us clearly, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there's nothing that we can do to quote unquote earn or obtain our own righteousness. It has to come by faith. You know, I was raised uh, in an environment that gave the gospel, but at times it could be somewhat legalistic. You know, like you might go to heaven if you don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with girls that do. Now, those things might benefit your health, but they have absolutely zero to do with being declared righteous by God. So how was someone in the Old Testament declared righteous or in the New Testament? Better yet, how are we declared righteous today? Let's look quickly back at Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, where we find Abraham, and we also find the answer to our question. Verse 6 of Genesis chapter 15 says, And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and God accounted it to him for righteousness. Abe believed God. Note, he didn't just believe in God, he believed God. Salvation has always been by faith in the promises of God. And Paul picks that truth up again in Romans uh, chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, and uses Abraham's faith in a, as an example in verse 5, where God promised Abraham that he would one day send a Savior who would die to pay for Abraham's sin. And the Bible says that Abraham believed that promise. In fact, Jesus said in John 8, 56, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. Why is that? Because Abraham believed the promises of God. Have you? Have you come to that place in your spiritual life where you realize that your righteousness before God, based upon what you have done, is as filthy rags? There's just, we are unable to save ourselves. Much like an individual who's cast off an ocean liner and he's drowning in the depths of the sea and they send out a dinghy, you know, to, 
to to save the guy and as the guy's bubbling down into the depths of the ocean and a hand is extended to him saying grab my hand i will save you and the man says i can do it myself that's the picture of self-righteousness and that's the picture of being lost both Zechariah and Elizabeth were upright because they believed in the promises of God and as a result lived out in obedience to what God had done for them as a result of his grace if you have and I can tell you I have come to put my trust completely in Christ as my Savior and Lord and if you have made that decision to say Nothing to thy cross I bring, only to thy cross I cling. You have, by the word of God, you've been declared righteous by God through faith in Jesus Christ. Think about that. You are as righteous as the Son because the Son has given you his righteousness. In exchange for our sin, Jesus gives us his righteousness. And Elizabeth and Zechariah had put their faith in the promises of God, not only the promises of God and his word in relationship to the Older Testament, that that's all they had. But they also put their promises in God, put their faith in the promises of God, that God would provide a Messiah, a deliverer, to save them from their sin. And when they put their faith in, in that coming Messiah, God declared them righteous. And then they demonstrated that faith by walking faithfully in obedience to what the Lord wanted for their lives. And so it happened that Zechariah was a priest in the temple. And verse 9 tells us that they had, a, uh, <laughs> they had a drawing every year. They cast a lot every year. And certain priests, out of the, I think it's 18,000 other priests, certain priests, a minimal amount of them, would be chosen to offer incense in the holy place of the temple at a given time in the year. And it happened, verse 9, that the lot fell to burn incense in the temple, and, and Zechariah picked the right straw. And he was chosen to be a part of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. He drew lots with 18,000 other priests, and he won the lotto. <laughs> and it was while he was in the temple doing this once in a lifetime event that he was touched by an angel with a very important announcement. Look with me at verse 17. And I need to turn in my Bible to verse 17. Here it is. Um, it says, well, we'll go back to verse, let's, let's look at verse 11. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. This is where Zechariah was burning incense to the Lord. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and he was gripped with fear. And I would be too. But when Zechariah saw him, he was gripped with fear. The angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Isn't that just like the Lord? Don't be afraid. How many times does God tell us, do not be afraid? I'm with you. Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of the Lord will he will bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the heart to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the righteous, or excuse me, and the dis disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So what was the message that the angel brought? Your prayers have been answered, Zechariah. You, you guys are going to have a son in your own age. Here God does another miraculous birth. And this son is going to be a prophet of God. It's at this point that the faithful Zechariah 
becomes the failing servant. You see, even though they were both faithful, Zechariah was failing. Isn't that true of us? Even though there are times in our life where we're completely faithful to the Lord, all it takes is one pop of the pen to burst the balloon. Uh, for all have sinned. And John writes to us, I write to you in order that you may not sin in the epistle of 1 John. But if anyone sins, the reality of it is, is that sinless perfection is not available here on earth. However, to be declared righteous by God is given to us as a promise that God gives. We are declared righteous by God, <clears throat> but we still have to live in this world. And that's where confession and restoration of fellowship happens. But Zechariah stumbled and he fell. He couldn't believe the possibility that he, being an older man, and that his wife Elizabeth, being an older woman, could possibly ever have a little baby. But with God, all things are possible. Verse 8 tells us that Elizabeth was, what, barren. And that's interesting. To, to be an older, childless woman in that culture was to be scorned. Some thought that she had possibly sinned against God, and that's why God had, had closed up her womb. And that's not true. Remember, God's perfect timing God has a plan for our lives, and God kept Elizabeth childless during this time of her marriage with Zechariah for a time to accomplish a greater miracle than even the miracle of birth, and that is the miracle of the birth of God's prophet. Well, the scripture tells us that time continues on. <clears throat> Elizabeth hadn't failed. And neither had God, but people believed perhaps that she had. But Zechariah did fail. And this is how he, how he did it. After all the promises are given by the angel in the temple, Zechariah opens his mouth and inserts his foot. Ever done that? <laughs> I have. To reveal the fact that he didn't believe what the angel had told him. Verse 18, Zechariah asks the angel, how can this be? How can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. How many of us have done that? We pray, God answers, and we say, how did that happen? Verse 19, the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Gabriel says, I have authority, and it's the authority of God, and if there's any authority we should believe, it's God's, right? But in, sp in spite of Zechariah's faithlessness, God's promises remain true. And men and women, I want to encourage you with this fact. God never fails. When he makes a promise, he fulfills it, even though we fail at times in believing it. Zechariah's mouth becomes mute as a discipline. But in spite of that, God provides the son. Verse 21, verse 21, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them, and they realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. I'd like to see that sign service right there, man. I bet he was like doing everything he could to communicate the incredible event that had just taken place in his life. And when his time of service was completed, he returned home. And after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my shame among the people. See, the people thought that Elizabeth had failed. That's why she couldn't have a baby, but she hadn't. God has a plan and purpose for our lives, and she had a plan and purpose 
for Elizabeth. God takes away her shame when she becomes pregnant. Elizabeth's cousin then, whose name is Mary, she then takes on shame when she becomes pregnant by the power of God. Isn't that interesting? Elizabeth's shame is removed when she becomes pregnant with John and her cousin Mary takes on shame because she's impregnated by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by the action of men. In spite of all the upsets and the failures that Zechariah had and his unbelief and Elizabeth's shame that she lived through for so long, God will accomplish his will for our lives. Are you experiencing a difficulty right now, maybe a trial? Have you prayed for deliverance only to seemingly wait for, with no answer from God? God's delays are not his denials, men and women. God not only hears, God has a purpose for our pain. The pain of the problem may grow in intensity, but know that God is not silent. He knows, he hears, he loves, he cares. God not only hears, God has a purpose. God never says, oops. God never says, how did that happen? God never says, what am I going to do now? By the way, COVID is not an accident. God knows all about it. And he has power to overcome its devastation in our lives. And certainly there have been families who have lost loved ones as a result of this terrible virus. And during this time, we can draw near to the Lord and ask for his comfort in our pain. God answers the pain of Zechariah and Elizabeth by providing a son born at just the right time, yet born overdue to Elizabeth and Zechariah. Yet their son would not only be miraculous in his birth, he would also grow to be one of Israel's finest, most powerful prophets. The reason for his greatness is found in the, in, in the power that God provides. The source of John's power is prophesied in verse 15. Notice what the scripture says in verse 15. He will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall neither drink wine or strong drink. Why was that? Well, it's very possible that God imposed on John, the baptizer, the Nazarite vow recorded for us in Numbers chapter 6. And if that's true, he would also never cut his hair and probably wouldn't be welcome in many churches today as a result. I mean, let's be serious. What would your first response be if some guy came in with incredibly long hair dressed in camel fur for the morning service, you'd call security, right? Uh, watch this guy on aisle three, okay? But note what else, what else is, happens with John in verse 15. It says, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Now, how is that possible? Well, it's possible because before Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came to dwell within the lives of every believer, the moment they put their trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit would come upon people in the Older Covenant. And he was upon John from his conception, the Bible says. So much for the idea that a baby isn't a person until the second trimester. Can I hear an amen on that? The Holy Spirit didn't fill a glob of tissue. He filled a little guy named John in the womb. And John would be filled with the Holy Spirit in his ministry, and the Holy Spirit would be John's source of spiritual power. And I must say this, it's only the person of the Holy Spirit that gives us the spiritual power we need to live the abundant life. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Some people say, well, I don't know how that happens. Well, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, it's a command. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Do not be drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but instead be filled, be controlled with the Holy Spirit. And if you know Christ, 
you have been baptized, you have been identified by the Holy Spirit into Christ, and the Holy Spirit lives in you. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? So how do we be controlled by the Holy Spirit? Well, we be controlled by the Holy Spirit by surrendering our lives to Him. Someone once called uh, the surrender of the Holy Spirit spiritual breathing, and, and they use 1 John 1, 9 as a text to illustrate when we confess our sin, we breathe out. And when we uh, inhale the power and the control of the Holy Spirit, we breathe in and know that we're forgiven. We've already been forgiven, but our relationship with the Lord is restored and the Holy Spirit is able to empower us. So here's the point. John was filled with the Holy Spirit and was, was a powerful, powerfully used of God. And all God calls us to do is surrender our lives to the Holy Spirit. You say, Spirit of the living God, fill me, control me, and then believe by the power and the promise of God that you are filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit. By the way, that commitment is to be continual <laughs> because we can at times allow the flesh to be large and in charge. Am I right? And when the flesh, that old you, takes over, then the Holy Spirit is not in control. And, and so there's a spiritual battle going on in our hearts. And the key to victory is continually surrendering ourselves over to the Holy Spirit. The symbol of power that John would walk in as one of the greatest uh, prophets of Scripture is also seen in verse 17, where it says uh, that John, let me move back, here. It's actually, this is a promise from the book of Ma Malachi. It says that, uh, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This special baby, Zacharias was told by Gabriel, would walk in the same prophetic office as Elijah. And Zechariah's baby would grow to fulfill God's last words of the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 where God says, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And that's exactly what John did. You see, the purpose of the prophet was clear. He came to prepare the way for Messiah Jesus to come. And by the way, this truth of what we're learning this morning can help prepare our hearts for the coming celebration of Christmas. Allow the Holy Spirit to fill you and control you. Make sure that there is no unconfessed sin in your life. Walk in obedience with the Lord and ready your hearts for the celebration of the, of the birth of our King, who, by the way, lives in you through faith in his finished work. Zacharias, after John's birth and circumcision on the eighth day, according to Jewish law, being filled with with the Holy Spirit as well, and, and he prophesies that as he speaks God's truth over his son, and this is what he says in verse 76 of Luke chapter 1, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you, you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Isn't that awesome? And that's exactly what John grew up to do. It was John who called Israel to prepare their hearts because Messiah was coming. It was John who baptized individuals who said, you know what, I'm identifying myself with your message. I am turning from my sin, and I'm waiting for Messiah to come. It was John who declared Jesus to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. And it was John, the prophet not dressed for success, who grew up in the desert, verse 80 tells me, until it was time for his ministry to begin. He not only prepared the way for Jesus, the Messiah, he was called to provide the way. And John provided the way for those who received the message that he had in th with three important truths. Number one, he called God, first of all, God called him to be that prophet, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission or the forgiveness of their sins. Second of all, he came to give light to those who sit in darkness and lie in the shadow of death. That's John's message. Also in verse 79, he came to guide our feet in the way of peace. 
Those three truths bring salvation, the message of salvation, the light of the gospel, and guidance are all found in the ministry of John. And he pointed people to who? He pointed people to the Messiah, Jesus. You know, this Christmas we have the same privilege as John, don't we? The story of John's birth is one of the greatest stories ever told, but it pales in significance when compared with the story of the birth and the ministry and the rule and the reign of our Savior. Each one of us here this morning were born miraculously for a purpose, and that purpose is to know God, to intimately and pur purposefully pursue a relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. Do you know the Lord Jesus? If John prepared the way for Christ, know this, the preparation has been made, and all you need do is say, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of the living God, and I believe that you died for me on the cross. I believe you were buried. I believe you rose again, and I want you to come into my life and save me. Be my Savior. Be my King. And I'll, I guarantee you this, based on the promises of God that you put your faith in Christ, He will deliver you. He will save you. Jesus said in John 14, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you will be also. So do you know the Lord? If not, just ask him to be your king. Just say yes to him. That's what John, that's what John's ministry was, to prepare people to say yes to Jesus. The second thing that John did was to bring as many people as possible, to introduce as many people as possible to the message of the coming kingdom. And that, men and women, is our call as well. This Christmas, can we make a commitment in our heart to tell at least one person about Jesus and his great work of salvation in our life. Do you have that one person in mind? John came <clears throat> to prepare the way for the Lord, and we can be used by God to prepare other people's hearts for the reception of the Lord Jesus himself. If you know someone, and we all do, who do not, who do not know the Lord Jesus, would you begin praying for them right now that this Christmas season they might open their hearts to the King who delivers Jesus. May God bless you. May, we, may God keep you. May his face continually shine upon you and give you peace. And I look forward to seeing you next week here on this YouTube link as we continue to study the wonderful power, the wonderful gift of God in Christ this Christmas season. I'll pray and we'll close. Thank you, Father, for the birth of a prophet who prepared the way for your son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for John. Thank you for Zechariah and Elizabeth and their faithfulness to not only trust you, but walk in obedience to you. And even though their obedience had its glitches, Lord, you are always faithful to fulfill your promise. Thank you for the message of Luke chapter 1 this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you next week.